This lecture covers alpha diversity, relative abundance, dominance and rarity within ecological communities, and mostly what we'll be talking about here are within ecological plots, or within plots. So first, what is an ecological community? An ecological community is an assemblage of interacting species and populations in a ge defined geographic area, usually within a single trophic level. Examples can include fish in a lake, all the plant species in a meadow, or insects in a dead tree or a group of dead trees. So as you recall in the beginning of the semester, in the field portion of the course, we talked about alpha diversity, beta diversity, and gamma diversity. Alpha diversity is the diversity within a plot or within a community. Beta diversity is the change in diversity between communities or between plots. And gamma diversity is the overall diversity within a area or among a group of interacting communities or over a whole bunch of plots. So why do we need to describe an ecological community? Why do we want to describe an ecological community? It's important for a number of reasons and describing e communities, the biodiversity in communities is important for academics, consultants, biologists and ecologists who work for the US government. Here's an example of wild from wildfires in the US. So this is about post fire burn severity and vegetation response in the western United States. So they characterized one year fires after one year and then followed up to understand post fire ecosystem recovery. So our homework three in this class we examine post-logging ecosystem recovery and applied alpha and beta diversity measures to assess whether there are differences still between logged and unlogged areas. So this figure shows that species richness, the number of species within a certain plot, was lowest across all areas when you had really severe fires and that the mean cover was also lowest after really severe fires. But there wasn't, a, there's not really a significant difference between low and moderate fires. So this is species richness and the mean cover. So we can think of, we can take those forward with us as we go on. Another example, maybe one applicable to the North Dakota oil fields. And this is an assessment of grassland restoration success and thinking about it in the terms of species diversity components, alpha, beta, gamma. And so the, this, these guys use additive partitioning of diversity and looked at and suggest that when we're thinking of grassland restoration success, we should be thinking of the proportion of native species, ecosystem processes, net product, primary productivity, and nutrient cycling. Those are important, but those are not necessarily components of diversity, but then thinking of plant diversity and functional diversity at all spatial scales and thinking of animal and microbial diversity at all spatial scales. So here's what they found. The top graphic on the right, A, shows species richness and species richness was lowest in restored prairies with the circles. That's the lowest fitted line there. So it had the lowest species richness which highlights how difficult it is to restore plant communities to pre-disturbance levels or pre-alteration levels. But when they factored in, and you can see there is some spread among the different natural prairie remnants and types, there's some spread in there in the number of species richness, but when you calculate diversity, which is a function alpha diversity here, which is a function of richness and the evenness which we'll come to, you can see there's no remnant differences, but what you can see is that the restored prairies have much lower diversity on average. And that their proportion 
And so why do we see that difference between richness and diversity measures, which we'll go over the diversity measures shortly. Why do we see that difference when the richness is, is differs, but the diversity of the natural remnants didn't differ? And that actually has to do with the, the proportion or the evenness of the number of plants there, the diversity measures. And in all those plots, you can see that in, in areas that were restored, the non-native species, the black bar, or, or the non-restored, the, uh, the restored plots, have the highest proportion of exotic species. So relative to all the other species, those plots had higher portion of non-native exotic species. So let's take that idea of the proportion and we'll come to and we'll come back to it in a minute. So why do we want to describe a community? We might want to re re describe it for restoration goals such as after mining when mining companies are responsible to restore the land that they've disturbed or they want to under or people, academics, scientists want to understand how different factors shape diversity. And it does depend on the way that, and the way we describe a community depends on our objectives. So what metrics can we use? We've talked a little bit about species richness, and now we'll bring in these other proportional methods that we'll think about for alpha diversity, so with insight diversity. So within a quadrat, or with, we can think about the relative abundance, species richness, how evenly the, the species are distributed within a plot. So the purport, you can think of it as human as wealth too. People look at the evenness of wealth distributions. Is it 99% and 1% where the wealth is distributed? It would be like saying 99% of the plant species are one species and 1% of the community is a diversity, of, is a group of other species. So we can calculate that into diversity, and then we'll come back in the end and we'll slightly touch on dominance and rarity. So relative species abundance is a measure of how common or rare species are compared to other species in the community. And it's a way to look and understand the distribution of species. Often patterns of relative species abundance are relatively similar among communities, and there's actually some very theoretical research that, can, that tries to explain relative species abundance distributions only using a couple of small parameters like the overall diversity, the migration, and certain, th that's called the unified neutral theory of biodiversity and biogeography, but we won't touch on that. So patterns of relative species abundance are well studied in ecology. So now we can go back and think of this example earlier, the proportion of exotic species in, in the community. So that if, they, if these restored communities have really high proportion of exotic species, the distribution of the other species, the relative abundance, may be affected. So let's talk about the relative abundance or rank abundance distribution. On the x-axis, you have the rank of the species abundance. So if, it appear, if it's in a community and the most abundant species was 50, and the next most abundant species was 10, then it would be ranked second on that community. So that's the rank of its abundance. And on the y-axis is its actual overall abundance. So this has some other information about how these things are sort of fit with different types of uh, models. But we won't really go into that. I just want everyone to concentrate on the idea that this is the most abundant species, ranked number one. This is the least abundant species on the bottom right, and it's ranked 130, 140, whatever the last last value is there. And then all the other species fall in here, so the y is the abundance, the x is their rank. And it forms an interesting shape to the distribution, and how the relative abundance is divided in a community can explain a lot about its diversity. So here's an example of community composition
that responds to disturbance gradients on barrier islands off the coast of Maryland. I think this is it. This was. Or Virginia, sorry. So we have two islands. The um, Metatompic Island and the Hog Island. And so here's those, here's the relative abundance distributions. And you can see we have different shapes. So here we have a really steep decline in relative abundance from between species one and species two, whereas in this relative abundance distribution, we have a relatively slower decline, greater species richness. You can always determine the species richness by just knowing the, the last rank of the least abundant species. And you can see that this looks like it has a really long tail with lots of rare species. This one maybe has a few more middling abundant species up in the top right. And that, that can exp and we can use this information to understand how evenly distributed the species are. So a less steep decline means higher evenness, and a really steep decline means lower evenness. So a really steep decline means that, for example, species A, B is really abundant, and the others are less abundant and have few and have lower uh, less abundant, and are and therefore the total proportion of what they contribute is smaller to the overall abundance of a plot set. Let's say. So here's an example from Kim's work on pine invasions in Argentina and Chile. And you can see in the in uninvaded sites, you have the total frequency, the maximum here, and each one of these bars indicates a species as it drops down. And so you have more middling abundant species here, lower richness in the invaded areas because you don't have the long tail, and you have lower relative, uh, lower relative abundance here. The same as in Chile, even though we have the same maximum relative abundance in the invaded and uninvaded areas, this one declines much more steeply in the invaded area and less steep in the uninvaded area. So more middle abundant species here, few more middling abundant species here, and even though they have the same richness. So this is a more even community. The abundance is more evenly distributed. And this is a less evenly distributed community. So the evenness, you can also, there's another, there's an index that's used in sociology and occasionally in ecology called the Jenny coefficient. And it measures wealth disparity. It was originally used to measure wealth disparity in society. So you can think of it in that same way. If that helps you visualize. So let's just go back and review a little bit. So we have the total spe the species richness, the total number of species in a sample. Quite a simple descriptor of the community. And that can be a problematic value sometimes if you didn't sample the exact same amount of area. So if that happens and you've sampled two different areas and you want to compare species richness, one way is to sort of correct for that. And this comes, this example comes directly out of the reading in your book, I think chapter five or chapter six, I can't remember exactly. And this is, uh, the, uh, so this is Chow estimated diversity. And what happens well, here is we take the total species richness and then we square the number of species or singletons that were only recorded one time and we multiply by two the number of species that were recorded twice and add that into the total species richness and then it allows us to make a small correction for different areas sampled. So here's an example from Kim's data that we just looked at the relative abundance distributions. So if we sample 21 plots and we had 92 species and we sample 27 singleton species. A singleton species is only recorded one time, and 18 species that were recorded in only two plots, we get a value of 112.45. And if we did the same thing for an Argentinian data set with only 13 plots,
then we can you we can use the species we can add the species richness to the squared proportion the square of this number of singleton species to and to the number of species recorded in eight plots and then we can make the direct comparison between these two and then we see that the US site had a higher overall estimated diversity based on chow on this chow index so a lot of what this math is is building mathematical indices or correcting for certain levels so diversity which we were out in the field and we often recorded richness is a function so diversity itself alpha diversity within a plot is a function of the richness within the plot the number of species and also how evenly distributed they are so it's a function of richness and evenness so what exactly is evenness it's a measure of how the different abundances of the species in the community are how the different abundances of the species in a community differ from each other so high evenness relatively similar abundance among all the species so you would have a big middling if you think of the relative abundance distribution you'd have a big middling abundance group of species that were all about the same and it wouldn't be a very steep decline low evenness means that one or few dominant species dominate so you'd have a really steep line quite often so the slope of that line would be zero and it transitions to zero here's an example of the same number of species but here we have a dominant species here this locust and then so this one would have more diversity versus this community which would be more evenly distributed so there's a couple of measures of alpha diversity that that are quite common in ecology and those are the Shan Sa Shannon and Simpson this e um, diversity indices so if diversity equals uh, richness and evenness then if we remove richness we get evenness and the same follows for the Simpson so if we just we can and then we can calculate these indices so what exactly is diversity and we'll come to that in a second so we're going to go over the Shannon and Simpson's diversity indices and think about it in the context of evenness so diversity is a function of richness and evenness so which community here is more diverse if they have the same species richness but different amounts of biodiversity this this one will have be have greater diversity because it's more evenly distributed so diversity is a function of evenness and richness and less even communities are less diverse than their richness alone would indicate there are many different diversity matrices that we can use and they're in chapter 5 box 5.1 which gives you just an idea of these alpha diversity indices I think there's a little bit about beta diversity in there too but we'll cover beta diversity next week so if we're gonna do these diversity calculations we have to make sure we keep them the same in space and time always use the same calculations and that the metric doesn't change so Shannon is this very common diverse, uh, metric H prime and it's the negative sum, the negative sum of the proportion of I multiplied by the log times the proportion of the species so where P is the proportion of all species so if you had 10 if you had 10 total species in a plot then and they all were abundant one time we'd have the sum of 1 over 10 times the log of 1 over 10 for the uh, for the whole thing so this is indexed along I right so it means we're taking all the species and summing this here and calculating this for each individual species um, so higher values equal higher diversity I showed that in homework 3 where I correlated the richness to the um, in uh, to Shannon and the inverse Simpson diversity indices and this, and we assume that all species are represented in the sample and they're not and they're randomly sampled the Simpsons 
the Simpsons diversity is the sum of the proportion squared, the probability that two samples are drawn from an infinite community, or that an infinite community are the same species. So this is the proportion that they would be drawn. And usually we do the inverse of the Simpsons diversity indices. So in uh, Simpsons is what we're using there, the inverse of diversity. So it's one over the sum of all those proportions. And the diversity and 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 the diversity the Simpsons diversity index measures homogeneity. So there's a need to alter it to get the diversity indices. That's why we're taking the one over d. So here's a an example of Shannon and Simpson's diversity calculations. So if we have species A, B, C, D, and we add up the total number of individuals there, we come to 14. So we're dividing 4 by 14 to get our proportional values. And then, and then we add those up, we can work through it. So we take 0.29 plus 0 0.07, uh, so we can calculate that for each one. So we'll take this. So the proportion of I, so 0.029 plus 0.027 plus 0.05 plus 0 0.14 and multiply those each by their individual logs, then we'll come and then we'll end up with the Shannon um, the Shannon diversity indices and the Simpson diversity indices if we didn't calculate that. So I'll go through a couple examples. So we can go through calculating it here. So we have, think of it here, we have butterfly, beetle, butterfly, ant, fly, and the number of species in site one and site two, and we want to calculate their Simpsons diversity indices. So here's for site one and site two. So we just have this one over 0 0.2 squared plus 0 0.1 squared plus 0 0.6 squared. So we get a value that totals one over that number is 2.38. And for the other site, 3.35. So even though they have the same richness, one of these sites has greater diversity. And you can look and intuitively see it that site one is less evenly distributed than site two. So site one has more diversity. So there's another other measures that we can think of for individual species, and that's dominance. So how does one or more species dominate a community? Often this is not an ideal measure because you end up with differences like thinking of what happens when you have really bare soil over here and not very many species, but then really diverse high productivity soils over there. So it doesn't necessarily work out as a very good metric. But we can think of it as the dominant species are the ones that are the rank one abundance and have the highest abundance. So again, just to reiterate, dominance is a measure of how one or a few species dominate the community. And the most simple is absolute dominance. And that's the abundant of the most, uh, uh, that's the number of the most abundant species. Uh, the number of the most abundant species compared to the number of the total there. So if you're adding up cover, you're adding up abundance, and then you end up with this relative proportion. The same as we were thinking about for the Shannon and Simpsons before. Dominance doesn't come up very much in ecolo ecological literature, and it usually refers to just one or a few species, so it's not a measure across the whole community. So then you can also think of high rarity metrics, and this uh, rarity metrics are quite are done perhaps in conservation science a little bit. It's so when you have very rare plants or a community with a number of very raw, rare plants. So this is the opposite of dominance metrics, um, and it usually counts the number of singletons or the proportion or the relatively small proportion. Often in communities, you can end up with very long rare tails on the relative abundance distribution. So many, many species that were sampled only one or a couple times. And so this stuff is covered in chapter five in your book. Have a look at it and think about, really think about diversity being a function, alpha diversity being a function of richness and evenness, and that the relative abundance distribution is an excellent way to to describe some of these patterns we see within groups. Next we'll move on and 
and talk about beta diversity. So thank you everyone. Oh, I have one more final example to show and that's thinking of functional diversity. And this is kind of a new field in ecology where we think of the function and then how, what function does each one of these species perform and do we have redundancies in function and how do we build this d diversity up over time. So here's an example of this diversity functional relationship for reef fishes between temperate and tropical sites. So as species diversity goes up in tropical sites, we have we don't have nest we have a relatively a more shallow increase in the functional types that we find. But in temperate ecosystems or temperate fish systems here, we have a much steeper increase in the functional diversity type. So an example of functional diversity type could be what they feed on, um, so if they're consuming algae or they're predators or they're eat, um, maybe they're, yeah, so different diets can indicate different functional diversity and how they function in the ecosystem. So in the tropics here we have an increase in func a much steeper increase of functional diversity in the temperate areas I should say compared to in tropical areas where you have a lot more fish. So that leads us to thinking about back to this back to the point of the lecture which is we need to think about how richness and diversity interact and incorporate functional diversity. So the second graphic that's an example from this paper just puts this on a map. So the species richness is lower in the temperate areas than it is in the tropical areas for fish. And functional group richness is a little bit lower but starts to increase in some of these areas. Species evenness is actually much higher in the, tropi in the tropical areas so, there, so you have more even distribution of diversity in those tropical areas. So a lot more species evenly distributed based on graphic A with more species in the tropical areas and the more evenly distributed, so a much flatter, less steep relative abundance distribution. But then if you think about it in functional traits or functional diversity, actually the Trop, uh, the temperate areas are as functionally diverse as the tropical areas in this case in most senses except for this Gulf of Mexico area parts of um, Western Africa and the edge of the Persian Gulf and the Adrian Sea um, or the Gulf of Aden um, so that just gives you an idea so what you can conclude about diversity depends on what metric you use and how we use it so we have to be careful when using all this stuff, and thanks for listening. That was a quick review of alpha diversity within plot diversity. Stay tuned next week for beta diversity and changes in beta diversity.